So hi guys, welcome back. Today we'll be looking at Salesforce and we're going to do a stock analysis on this. Uh, the ticker symbol is CRM uh, and we'll get onto the video. Uh, before we do, if you do enjoy, consider subscribing. It doesn't cost you anything and it helps me out a ton. If not, thanks for watching anyway, onto the video. So what we'll be covering in this presentation, we'll be covering what the company does, the financials of the company, the future of this company and comparisons with the market and its industry, the trends of this current stock and an entry price if you do choose to invest. At the end, I'll have a final word, a 30 second recap of what we covered and my opinion on this stock as well. So about Salesforce, uh, Salesforce is a cloud-based software company and what it does is it manages customer, uh, customer relationships between a buyer and a seller, usually a tech company. Um, and this is on the rise as many tech companies are shifting to a more customer-based uh, customer models uh, like things such as subscriptions um, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, CRM, uh, the CRM software also allows business to stay on top of marketing campaigns as well as address uh, customer service issues. Um, all of the things that I've just mentioned uh, are becoming more and more prominent in today's market, especially with um, Salesforce having 20% of the CRM market share, the customer relation uh, management market share, uh, which is more than the second, third, and fourth largest competitors combined. Uh, and this company's dominance over the field will no doubt play into their favor as they lead their industry and this industry is set to rise in the future as well. Uh, they've also recently acquired uh, Slack Enterprises, which together um, helped smoothen out the customer relation management services that Salesforce does. And the CEO has said that the, comp uh, the companies complement each other and uh, acquiring Slack Force will help the future of the company. Uh, so that's about what Salesforce does. Um, now let's go into the financials. So if we look at the financials, we can see uh, the financials were pretty sloppy until 2017 where it really started kicking off and we can see that earnings per share increasing from 0 0.46 to 0 0.5, uh, 1.43, uh, a very big drop in 2020 and you'll see this trend kind of all throughout this whole thing. A uh, very big drop in 2020, but in the trailing 12 months, they're once again back uh, better than ever. So earnings per share, although um, 2020 was a significant downfall. Uh, I would still give it a good solid five year trend of earnings per share growth. Uh, its book value per share has also consistently been increasing as they acquire more and more assets. Uh, however, the book value per share is nowhere near the stock price, the stock price being greater than $200. Um, so this, nece uh, this wouldn't necessarily be an asset play stock, but it's good to see that their book value per share is increasing. Uh, it's free cash flow is also increasing with a very good standard showing this company is making more and more money. So another plus, uh, it's return on equity. Once again, pretty sloppy until 2017, where it finally became positive. Um, but even since then it's return on equity has been quite low. Um, this necess uh, this, uh, means that. Uh, the company isn't making very good use of the shareholders' equity, um, so it does not necessarily have a very good return on equity. Uh, the same can be seen with the net margin. Uh, its net margin has also been pretty much in line with the return on equity, um, showing that this company's uh, the way the company is running their business is very capital intensive, and they're very they're not able to retain uh, very much of the profits that they're doing. However, towards the end of return on equity and net margin, you can see quite big jumps, uh, having a 10% return on equity, which isn't great, but isn't as low as it was in the previous with 0 0.5, 1, 1, and 3. Uh, so its return on equity is improving and its net margin towards the end, you could see 17 and a half, and that's a very good uh, net margin there. So although uh, the return on equity and net margin are pretty good as of right now. Um, I'm not willing to give this a good return on equity or net margin as this doesn't have the trends to show that they can keep this over a long time. Uh, it's interest coverage. Uh, it seems like they've paid off their interest uh, in 2020. Um, and we can see that in their debt as well, that their debt decreased. So interest coverage basically means a dash basically means that they're not paying any interest on their debt and their debt to equity is also quite low 0 0.13 showing that they do have enough assets to overcome their liabilities and debt. Uh, it's PE ratio you could see uh, is very, very uh, fluctuating. However, a good sign we can see is that the PE ratio is decreasing as the uh, stock price is increasing, uh, showing that the company's, uh, although the stock price is increasing, the company is uh, increasing at a better rate than what the stock price is. Uh, so although the PE ratio of 
58 is very, very high, uh, showing very, very overvalued as of right now. It's good to see that the trend is the stock price going up and the PE going down, showing the company's improve, improving faster than the stock price can catch up. Uh, its PEG ratio is quite high of 3.17. Uh, showing that its uh, growth is not necessarily very uh, good uh, as of right now compared to its PE ratio because necessarily if you have a very high PE ratio such as this has a 58 PE ratio you would necessarily want a very low PEG ratio because it signifies that the company is going at a very fast rate however what we're seeing is that this PEG ratio and PE ratio would be quite heavily skewed uh, because of the earnings per share growth has fluctuated a lot over the past five years uh, so that's why uh, you could see that this PE ratio uh, is quite high and this PEG ratio is quite high as well. However, just for the sake of being conservative, uh, I wouldn't say this is a very valued stock based on the PE ratio or the PEG ratio. So let's look at some extra uh, like info, the long term, the future of this company uh, and some comparisons. So as of simply Wall Street, it's 24% undervalued. I would tend to disagree with this looking at the PE ratio. Um, however, uh, once we go along later, looking at the trends, you could see why they might consider it undervalued as of right now. Uh, its PE ratio of 55 or 58, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is only slightly better than the industry, which is 56, uh, but it is much higher than the market uh, of 30. Uh, just to mention, my previous data is a few uh, months old because it isn't updated on a regular basis, while this is the most recent data. Um, so its P ratio is lower than the industry, but higher than the market. And although it's lower than the industry, uh, it's showing that the company is very overvalued in comparison to the general market and not much more uh, undervalued than the industry as a whole, uh, which is why I don't believe it's an undervalued company. Its PB ratio of five is better than the industry or 10. However, PB ratio of five uh, shows that it does have more assets than its industry but does not necessarily make it a good asset play company such as a bank uh, because its uh, assets don't really come anywhere near the price being five times lower. Its revenue is set to grow at 16% per year, which beats the industry of 13% and the market of 10%, showing good solid growth in the future. Uh, its earnings are set to rebound after a severe drop in 2020. As I mentioned, the trailing 12 months is much, much higher than what it was uh, in 2020. Um, and it's uh, set to grow about four billion in 2021, a slight drop in 2022, and from there continuously set to grow up till 2025 based on the current knowledge of many analysts. Uh, it's five year average past uh, earnings growth over the last five years is 55% uh, compounding. However, once again, this is heavily skewed uh, because their earnings per share in the past was very, very low. Uh, well, now it's very, very high, but it does show that the company is growing at a pretty solid rate. Uh, its assets also clearly overcome liabilities and that's seen with their low debt to equity as well. So now looking onto the trends, we can see over the last five years, uh, this company has had a very solid growth growing from about $50, $60 to about $220 as of right now. A few months ago, it hit its top at about $280, but since then it's been a steady decline from about um, October, uh, October, November, uh, December have been consistent declines for this stock. Um, and we could see this more into play if we look at the one year trend. Uh, we could see that back in September, it really hit its high, but October, November, and December, and in January as well, this company has uh, very slowly come down to a downtrend. Um, and this downtrend has basically pushed their price all the way up from uh, 280 to 220. And with that, we could see the 20-day simple moving average is below the 50-day simple moving average. Uh, this might suggest a recent downtrend. However, because the 50-day simple moving average has not dropped below the 200-day uh, simple moving average, um, I would not cl uh, classify this as a downtrend uh, because the price because the stock price still has that uh, line of support that it can rebound, which is a 200-day simple moving average. So what we have is the stock price is currently almost at the tip of the simple moving average. So if you do want to buy, this would be a very good option as it would seem to rebound from the 200-day simple moving average. Uh, we've seen this in the past as well, earlier in 2020, where the stock price uh, went below the simple moving average about here, uh, and then 
after going down, it once uh, once again came back up and then shot through the roof since then. So it looks like this will be uh, what is going to happen, either rebound of the 200-day simple moving average, which was once again classified by, uh, signaling that the downtrend was averted. Uh, but if it does go below the 200-day SMA, I would suggest wait a bit, wait for it to come above the 200-day SMA after that, and then once again, it would classify a buy. So based on the current trends, an entry price would be close to $220. So just some final words, it's a solid company leading the industry. It has semi-solid financials, but is yet to build that uh, track record that we would see from many top companies, but just give it some time. Uh, but the financials aren't too bad uh, if you compare it to most growth companies. Uh, its recent drop in price since about October, uh, August, September top uh, has brought it to a very good buy zone if you do choose to invest. Uh, but do beware of high PE and high PEG ratio, uh, showing that this company is quite overvalued if you look at it from a traditional sense. Uh, but overall, my opinion would be that this company is a very good buy. We've seen that the market in recent times has not really cared whether this company is traditionally overvalued, but just generally looks at the future of this company and the future of this company looks very, very healthy. But as always, do your own due diligence. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.